Susie Orman says everyone needs a living trust. Do you? Well, we're going to talk about that here today at the Heritage Wealth Planning YouTube channel. So don't forget to subscribe if you like what we talk about here. Um, I had a lady uh, on my on my own YouTube channel comment when I was doing a thing on trust the other day about my thoughts on Susie Orman's uh, suggestion that everybody needs a living trust. And so I figured I'd look it up and um, I, I don't agree with it, but uh, you know, let's talk about that a little bit here. And this will be a quick one. Uh, first and foremost, I am not an attorney, my friends. So don't rely on me for legal advice because I don't know legal advice. I'm just telling you from my perspective as a financial planner, uh, what I feel. But from a, a legal capacity, you do not rely on me because I can't provide you legal advice. I recommend instead of going to computer models, uh, you go to a professional attorney, a real live human being to get your estate plan done. The idea that an estate plan that you're creating, which is going to provide guardianship to your children, long-term uh, arrangement of your affairs for when you're in, alive and incapacitated and dead, uh, that you just have some computer software from a, I don't know some guy who wrote up from India or something like that, just boggles my mind. Especially when it doesn't cost all that much to at least get your documents drawn up, a will, power of attorney, power of attorney living will. Uh, healthcare directive. I mean, get that stuff drawn up from an estate planning attorney in your state who knows the difference between Georgia power of attorney rules and Florida uh, power of attorney rules. And when it changes, that we can keep up to snuff on that. Don't get a computer program for heaven's sake. Now, if you're getting living trust, you're probably going to double the cost of your estate documentation. I, I'll grant you that. Well, then ask your attorney. Say, do I need that? And if the attorney is, is all, yeah, everyone needs a living trust like Susie, I say, why? And let, let them explain it to you. So let's go over what Susie says why. And I'll tell you why I think she's incorrect here. Uh, and this is from October 2013. It's a three paragraph article. Weird. Um, uh, Orma spells it out. A living revocable trust serves as far more than just where assets are to go upon your death. And it does that in an efficient way, she says. Unlike a will, a living trust also covers you while you're still alive. You must think of, think about it. What happens if something happens to you and you become ill or incapacitated? Well, I agree with that. Who's going to take care of you and pay the bills? A key difference between a will and a living trust is that the living trust has an incapacity clause that states you want uh, who you want to sign for your affairs in the event you are unable to do so for yourself. Be mindful of the key difference between a revocable trust and a revocable, irrevocable trust or revocable. If you want to be fancy schmancy, uh, us people born in uh, you know the rural part of Maine, we just say irrevocable because it's pronounced like it, it looks like that's the way it should be pronounced. <laughs> and the irrevocable trust cannot be modified or terminated without permission of the beneficiary. Once the grantor transfers the assets in the irrevocable trust, he or she removes all right to ownership of the trust and the assets. So we're not talking about irrevocable trust here. I'll do a video on that at some point. Uh, we're just talking about uh, living trust. A living trust means you are the grantor. You're granting the property from your name, old Josh, into Josh's living revocable living trust. Revocable living trust, living trust, inter vivos trust, all the same thing. It means it can be revoked by the grantor or the trustee, typically on a revocable living trust. The grantor, Josh, grants my assets into the trust. So I'm the grantor and uh, it'd be stunned if I were not the trustee as well. But I guess there could be some times where the grantor is not the trustee. But the vast majority of living trusts that I've seen, the grantor and the trustee are the same person. OK, so that's what's happening here. So given as revocable, the grantor remains complete ownership of it. All taxes flow to the grantor's social security number. And the grantor can change it at his or her discretion anytime he wants. I always remember on a living trust, they do become irrevocable at death. All right. So you just got to keep that in mind. One thing I was surprised to see here, Susie um, talked, she didn't say anything about funding the trust. And I've said this in a couple of videos before, but if this is your trust document and it has nothing underneath it, if it's empty, the trust document isn't worth the papers written on because it can't control anything for which it does not own. All right. So if I want the ownership to in my trust, I need to have an asset in it. I need to have an asset in it for it to control. And if there's no asset in it, there's nothing for it to control. So we can say all day long, the living trust has an incapacity clause, but it only has an incapacity clause to the extent that there's something underneath that in which to control. That's a big deal. That's called unfunded trust and unfunded trust to run rampant, in my opinion, in the financial planning, uh, because people recommend doing trust, but they don't put any assets in the trust, which is... Bob was a mine. Secondly, she says incapacity issues. A will can't solve incapacity issues. Well, if you're getting your state docs, you're going to get the will. 
You're going to get the living will. Living will is just a right to die cause. You're going to get a health care directive and you're going to get the durable power of attorney. The durable power of attorney establishes incapacity. And that's exactly what it does. It says in my incapacity, I give Charlotte the right on my to act on my behalf as if she were me. That's what a durable power of attorney does. So I don't I don't get that. Why she says the will. I mean, any competent attorney is going to draw you up those four docs and throw a letter of instruction in there as well which is not binding, but a letter of instruction is very explicit. It says, this is what I want to happen with my assets at my demise. Again, it's not binding, but it's, it's a nice little letter of instruction telling people what to do with their assets when you die. So surprised to hear she didn't uh, talk about that or durable power of attorney. Another thing too, with an unfunded trust, you can have incapacity cause, but again, if there's nothing in there, there's no incapacity. There's nothing to do for incapacity. Whereas a durable power of attorney, it doesn't have to be established on the front end. I mean, you don't have to say, I mean, a durable power of attorney is, it just is. It says at the end of the day, Charlotte has my, uh, uh, the ability to act on my behalf in my capacity. Now there's different rules that you should be careful of. You probably don't want to say, I need two doctors to validate that I'm incapacitated, but I leave that to you and your attorney. I don't, I say, Charlotte's my money's hers, her money's mine. Even if it's only in my own name, she has access to it unencumbered. So Charlotte could go down there and tell USA, hey, it's me, Charlotte, I'm going to take my husband's money and USA, which has already proved my durable power of attorney would, would give it to her. And she could you know go and go crazy. And that's, well, I mean, <laughs> that's what it 